All right, let's go. Uh, if you have a question, just ask. Um, I was gonna do the whiteboards, but they are not really that great. So we're gonna stick with this for now, because it's working. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about fundamental data structures, and what I mean by this is I just want you guys to be completely comfortable with, if you were to read a paper, um, I don't want you to see something that you've never heard of before or see something that you are too intimidated to try to interpret the data. Because what you really need to do when you read these papers and the tendency is, especially when you're starting off, to just skip interpretation of the data and just read the words, um, that is a huge mistake, okay? You're never gonna succeed if you, if you do that. Because the whole point is to learn how to critique the data, to not, you don't wanna trust it, you wanna make conclusions by yourself. So if I start assigning papers um, instead of these textbook readings, the goal is to have you look at the figures and to try to draw your own conclusions from the data in the figures. So I wanna give a brief introduction, which is probably gonna be mostly review of the kind of data that you're gonna see in biotechnology, the kind of data, uh, the actual, like what it looks like, what you're gonna be looking at, and I want you to understand all the methods. So to relate it back to the earlier um, lectures, there's four different types of molecules, and you've all read about those now, right? There's the nucleic acids, there's the proteins, there's the lipids, and there are the carbohydrates, sugars, okay? And I told you last time that each of these is gonna have their own methods, right? Because they're different chemically, they're different structurally, and that means the things that you can do to them in experiments, uh, actually it depends on their chemical structures, right? So these are all gonna have different kinds of methods, um, and you wanna be familiar with the methods uh, so that you can interpret the data, okay? So let's first start to talk about methods with nucleic acids. Nucleic acids. So this is gonna be DNA and RNA, okay? So the first thing, agarose gel. Have you guys heard that before? Mm -hmm. What's the purpose of an agarose gel? It splits things up by size. Yes, perfect. Size. Okay, so in an agarose gel, and one thing that you'll see in molecular biology everywhere is gel. Okay, whenever you see gel, that's the purpose of a gel. A gel is basically a situation where you have micro pores, micro holes, okay? And you're basically inducing things to run through these holes. So most of the time you'll see things separated by size in gels, or you can adjust it to charge, um, or you can adjust it to salt concentration, things like that. Um, but whenever you see gels, you are basically the strategy, the underlying fundamental strategy is you're taking chemicals and you're running them through tiny pores and you're inducing um, different separation based on how they, their mobility through the gel. Okay, so in all gel systems, <coughs> there's gonna be differences in how you regulate the pore size. Okay, so the size of the actual pores. Okay, and in agarose, you can, this is one variable that you can change, okay? So agarose is like a sugar, kind of like polymer thing, and if you put, if, if let's say this is a curve of concentration of agarose, okay? If you start with low agarose, low percent in your gel, um, there's gonna be less Polymer, polymer, okay. And so it's gonna be a lot easier or harder for big things to go through? Easier. Yes, it's gonna be a lot, perfect, very good. It's gonna be a lot easier for big things, okay? If you have low percent agarose. If you have high percent agarose on this end, okay, it's gonna be a lot harder for big things to run through. Okay, and I say this is a variable because you actually, you're never gonna be making the same gel every day. Every day you're gonna be changing the gel. Well, I mean, there are kind of like standard things that you wanna do, but let's say, so imagine you're doing a PCR and you wanna check a PCR product and your PCR product is 1,000 base pairs, okay? You might wanna run a higher percent, higher percent agarose gel 
to get maximal separation around that 1000 base pair size range. Okay. So that means you're going to be running something that's or actually, I should say I made a mistake there lower because you want to make it. Hang on. I'm thinking this through as we go. Let me write out the percentages. So if you ran like a 0.8% agarose, um, compared to like a 2% agarose, 2% agarose is going to separate out small things well. Did I, did I give you the reciprocal? Or does this make sense? Okay. <laughs> Okay, and 0.8% is going to separate out large things well. Okay, so let's say this is a 2% agarose gel, and you load it with tiny things, which are 100 um, base pairs. You've increased the polymer, okay? So your tiny things are going to really have to struggle to run through this. So you're going to get maximal separation the tiny things are going to run through fast, but it's going to be literally impossible for the big things to run through this and separate out. So all your big stuff is going to be just like literally like a blob at the top if you're running a high percent agarose gel. OK, let's do the reciprocal. So let's do let's change this to a low percent, like 0.8 percent. This is really good for big things. So like your 1,000 to 10,000 base pair range. If you're going to like check plasmids, right? Plasmids, this is a good concentration 0.8%. Okay. So your little stuff, it's going to run through super easy because the agarose concentration is really low. So it's just going to, as soon as you turn on the electricity, DNA has a negative phosphate backbone. So that's what's going to be the force that pushes it through. And it's going to run through super fast if they're tiny. Okay. So all your tiny stuff is going to be a little blob at the bottom of the gel, but your big stuff, is going to separate out because it's going to be a lot. It's it's going to be um, it's going to be able to go through, but it's going to be at the right difficulty where it can separate out big stuff. So let's say a thousand base pairs to ten thousand base pairs. Does that make sense? What's up? So does it work basically like a sieve? Or is it yes, that's exactly the um, the idea. Is you're just making different pore sizes based on the percent of the polymer that you put in and then you're inducing chemicals to run through. Okay. Very good question. Um, okay. So here's another problem. Uh, and so, so for, if you look at the lecture notes for each of these types of experiments, I basically have outlined what you can get out of these experiments. So if you run an agarose gel, it says here, you can visualize the presence or absence and the size of specific constructs, constructs, or PCR products. So these are, again, nucleic acids, right? If you make a plasmid, you can look at the size of that plasmid or the shape in so many ways um, on an agarose gel, or you can measure the size of your PCR products, okay? Now, here's a problem. How are you able to see the DNA in an agarose gel? Is DNA visible? Can you see it with the naked eye? No. So how do you see the DNA on an agarose gel? Is it dye? Yes, you could call it dye. Do you know what dye? Can I see blue? That's protein. Mm. Good though. See, this is see, this is where we're starting to see the differences between nucleic acids and proteins. Yes, you'll add a dye. So that is that is conceptually correct. It's called um ethidium bromide. Okay? And you'll see it uh truncated as something like that. That means ethidium bromide. There's other dyes as well, okay? But ethidium bromide is what most people use. So let me just, I have a picture of this in the lecture notes. So here's ethidium bromide. Here's the chemical. You don't need to know the chemical structure, but what I want you to know is that ethidium bromide, so if this is a base pairing, if this is a base pairing, ethidium bromide will intercalate between the DNA base pairs, okay? So ethidium bromide actually has an affinity for DNA and it gets stuck to the DNA, 
Okay. That means if you drink Ethidium bromide, it will get stuck to your own DNA and you will probably mutate yourself. So don't drink uh, Ethidium bromide. Okay, so you add, Ethidium bromide is gonna be an essential ingredient when you mix up your gel. You have to add Ethidium bromide, otherwise you will not be able to see your DNA. So when you look at an agarose gel, you only see Ethidium bromide but the ethidium bromide is stuck to the DNA, okay? So you would put it, uh, if you ran your gel, you put the negative charge here, the electrode, your DNA runs through, runs away from the negative charge, you get your band separation, and then what you do is you turn on a UV light, okay? And that causes the ethidium bromide to fluoresce, and then you see your lanes. So let's just take a look. We can literally just go to like Google uh, and just make sure that you guys get a good example, get a good feel for like what an agarose gel is gonna look like. Let's see, Google. Agarose gel. Let's say, let's put plasmid. Let's look at, see if we can find a plasmid. I'm sure we will if we just look for images. Images. So this is what you're going to see, right? These are what the lanes look like. So let's look at here. Okay. Key control that you need um, right here. Can Are you able to see what I'm... No, you're not. Okay. So on the left in M, that stands for marker. You'll see that quite a bit. So that's a DNA ladder and BP stands for base pairs. So the ladder is literally telling you the sizes of these products, whatever they are. I don't know if these are PCR products. It's probably more likely that they're plasmids because they're a bigger size. Okay, so what you're seeing is in these in these bands, you're seeing ethidium bromide light up the P, the plasmid. And this one, the first one in lane one is about at the size of maybe 2,500 base pairs, right? So you can get a good idea of the size and getting a good idea of the size is gonna allow you to see certain things and to judge whether the construct that you made or a PCR product that you made is correct. Because when you design your PCR primers, you put a primer here, you put a primer here, you know the precise distance in base pairs between these PCR products, which is called your amplicon, that's what you're amplifying, okay? And you know the exact size. So you should be able to predict before you run the agarose gel precisely where your band is. And if it's not there, there's something wrong with your experiment. Okay, so we talked about the ladder. Um, okay, we talked about ethidium bromide. Positive negative controls. Every experiment needs a positive and a negative control. So let's talk about in theory about let's a uh, case scenario and what your positive negative control would be. So let's say this is a uh, low percent, 0.8 percent agarose gel. Okay, and we want to run a low percent, 0.8 percent, because we want to look at plasmids. Let's say we we had plasmid A and we want it to insert gene X, gene X. And we think we did it and we're gonna test it. So we purify plasmid A with gene X inserted, okay? So that's gonna be our test. So I'll put test lane right here, okay? So in theory, we would run a marker. Let's say what we wanna know is we wanna know A by itself, size. Let's say it's 3,000 base pairs, and let's say we know gene X, gene X, PCR amplicon, is 1,000 base pairs. So A plus X should be 4,000 base pairs, okay? So we could run a very, very simple experiment. Let's see if I can get a red pen. Lighting up like ethidium bromide. Awesome. Okay, so let's run our lanes. Let's say lane one is always going to be your marker. You need that. That's a control that's going to run out like this. Okay, so let's say this is 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Okay, <clears throat> next lane we're usually going to run is we're going to check to see if our PCR works. So let's run the PCR amplicon. This literally came straight out of the tube from the PCR reaction. So lane two will be PCR amplicon. PCR amplicon of gene X will be 1000 base pairs. So if it worked, 
we would see something light up right here. And something that you'll often see is you'll see, maybe you'll see a light smudge or a light smudge up here. These are what you would call non-specific products. You don't worry too much about that, but it's nice to know what they are. You're never going to see, well, you will if you're real good like me. But if you're, uh, if you're just starting off, you're always going to see like this other stuff, other stuff. Okay. And so it's important to know kind of what, where that's coming from. It's, these are non-specific products. That means your PCR primers are amplifying other things in your reaction. Okay. Uh, your next lane, you might want to run a negative control. What's your negative control going to be? The experiment is testing whether or not Gene X got inserted into plasmid A. So it just be the plasmid. Correct. Negative control will be plasmid A, which will be size 3,000 base pairs. Okay? So you'll see 3,000 base pairs. Ah, but you won't just see that. You will not. You will see three bands. You will see one band at 3,000. You will see another band smaller than 3,000, and you will see another band much higher than 3,000, okay? These are your three classical plasmid bands. You always see three bands when you purify plasmids. You will see the top band, which is concatenated rings. So plasmids are rings, and they can get interlocked, and they can't separate apart, okay? So your top band in your agarose gel will be concatenated rings. This one will be linear, plasmid. So this is plasmid that broke. Okay. It's broke or it's just sealed. Um, it's kind of complicated. I'll tell you in a second, but okay. You'll see a band that corresponds to your, basically your normal plasmid. Okay. And then you'll see a band that is smaller, which is called supercoiled. Okay. Do you know what supercoiled plasmid is? It's where they like wrap around themselves. Like they break and reseal. I don't know if I'd characterize it like that. Anybody else? It just kind of folds in on itself. I don't know if folds in on itself is the right way. So imagine you take a rubber band, okay, which is like a plasmid, and you grab it here, and you grab it here, and you just start to twist, and you twist, and you twist. And what will happen is it will basically go like that, right? Okay, so you're putting a lot of tension into the DNA molecule and the cells will do this and it shrinks the size, shrinks the size. So that's why you see it much lower because it's much smaller particle. So it can run through those pores a lot faster, okay? So this is what your gel would actually look like in your negative control A. You'd see three bands and as long as this thing was here, you'd say, oh, okay, that worked out. That's, that's a good negative control. You don't have to be worried about these other other sizes, okay? And then your next lane, so you have a negative control, you have a positive control. What could be a positive control? It's kind of a tough question. You gotta think creatively. Could you specifically mix the thing you were saying about the base pairs? It's like yeah, maybe you, that's a good, that's a perfect. So let's say you got plasmid A. Maybe a year ago you were working on something different and you built a different construct that had gene Y. Oh, is it? What's going on here? There we go. Gene Y. And you can just pull this thing out of the freezer. You made this a long time ago. Okay. And it doesn't have to match exactly. But maybe it's something that is maybe a little bit bigger. Okay, so a positive control would be would look then like this. It's a little bit bigger. Since it's a little bit bigger, all three of these bands are going to be what's called upshifted. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's a good positive control. And you might not have one. You might not have one. But a good experiment will always have a positive and a negative control. It's my job to also teach you guys fundamentals and how to think. What's up? So is the PCR amplicon just like the raw output of a PCR experiment? Correct. Okay. That is exactly what you're replicating. Um, it's the amplicon. It's just the amplicon. Okay, and then your test, now you did your ligation, you did your transformation, you purified this thing, and now your test, it should, let's say it matches the size of Y precisely, it should then match this precisely. And again, sometimes you don't have a positive control. So sometimes you won't have this, but what you would look for is 
do I get this upshift? If I get this upshift, that means I definitely inserted something into the plasmid. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is stereotypically what you're going to be looking at. And on a day to day basis, when you make plasmids and constructs for molecular biology, that's a very, very common thing that you will you will do. OK, before we get any further, what's yep. the term you used for um, when the plasmids were you said they went together? Concatenated. Concatenated, Concatenated rings. Rings. Concatenated. I think that's that'll come up later. I don't know if I put that in this lecture, but that definitely comes up as a bold word later. That's concatenated, though. Okay, let's talk about fit. Oh. You want your test to look like positive control? In theory, that's a good positive control. A positive control, the purpose of it is to do something that you know for a fact is going to work, and then your test, if it worked, should look precisely like your positive control. But the positive control is another thing that you did. Like it's different from right. So I'm saying I'm saying you can be a little bit creative here. I'm saying you let's say let's say you made this positive control here. You don't necessarily have to use gene Y. Let's say you use you. I'm just saying you pull out something from the freezer. Let's say you cloned gene C a long time ago. Okay. Let's say gene C is even a lot a lot bigger. Let's say gene C is way bigger than X. It's a two thousand base pair product. Okay. So in that case, your positive control is going to be even higher than your like experiment. Okay. But what you're controlling for here is basically an upshift in the DNA. So basically the comparison is compared to your negative control, you know, your positive control is going to have this upshift effect, right? So you're kind of controlling for basically just a difference that you can measure visually. Okay. And one reason you might need this, let me give you a good example of why you might need this. Okay. So let's say your percent agarose is wrong. You made the wrong gel. Let's say you made a 2% or even you got wacky and you made a 4% agarose gel. Okay. What's going to happen with your stuff? It's all going to be up here. And then if you ran your positive and your negative control, you would not be able to tell the difference because you didn't separate it out enough. Does that make sense? So in that case, because you did your positive and negative control, now you know, looking at that data, oh, I know what I need to do. I just need to reduce the percent agarose so that to make it visually separate out so where I can actually ex uh, visually interpret the data. Does that make sense? Is that is that clarify? Okay. Good question. I like the questions. Um, okay, so let's so that's that's basic agarose gel stuff. Okay. Um, let's talk about fish. Okay. So fish is fluorescent in C two hybridization. So in this, what you're going to be doing is this fish actually will tell you where on a chromosome is a DNA sequence. So let's say you want to study gene X. This is the ORF, the open reading frame. You want to know where that gene is on the chromosome. You have no idea. Okay. What you can do is you can design what are called probes, which are little oligos. Okay. So these would be composed of base pairs. And if they match the sequence of or if X, gene X, that you want to study, and you get those into the cell, they're going to be able to find that sequence, and they're going to be able to bind to it. Okay, so let's say your oligo binds right here on the chromosome, because that's where it found that matching sequence. Then the secret is the probes have a fluorescent marker that causes that spot on that chromosome to light up when you shine a light on it. So this will look like... Here's a good example. So what they're looking at is they got some sequence that they've coated with a probe that uh, fluoresces green, and they've got some sequence coated with a probe that fluoresces red. And this is a karyotype. So these are the chromosomes that they purified out from some organism. I don't even know what the context of this is, but I'm just telling you this is how you interpret it. And they're telling you the probe is right there on that chromosome. Right? Because that's where it is. It's where it's shining. So that's fluorescent in C2 hybridization. Okay. The other application for this is let's say, let's say you got a plant cell. Plant cell. Okay. And you have 
you know that there are symbionts that live in that plant cell. So there are bacteria that live in that plant cell. You want to know where they are. Okay. You can make fish probes for the bacteria genome. And then you can do fish and it's going to bind and light up to the bacterial chromosome wherever the bacteria are localized. So maybe you would make a conclusion that, oh my gosh, these bacteria are only in this particular organelle. Because when I do fish, the genomes light up right there. Does that make sense? Okay, so fish will tell you where a specific gene sequence is. And the key is specific. You have to design the oligoprobes. Okay, it's going to tell you location. You can also do it with messenger RNA. It's nucleic acid technique. Usually most of these nucleic acid techniques, if you can do it with DNA, you can do it with RNA. So you could also do it with RNA, but then you're measuring transcript location, not genome location. So you got to know what, what the people are doing. Um, the other thing with fish is that it will kill the cell. You have to do what's called fixing the cell. So this is not a live technique. So you're going to notice in molecular biology some things you can do when the cells are alive and you get certain benefits from that and some things you have to do when the cells are dead and you get certain benefits from that. Okay, So you have to kill the cells to do fish because you have to permeabilize the membrane to get your probes into the cell. Okay. Um, positive and negative control for fish. Um, Let's look at that. Let's look at that experiment. Maybe the one one scenario. Maybe this person's positive and negative control was they picked a gene on the X chromosome. And so their positive control was maybe the red sequence probe and maybe their test probe was the green one. So this is their X, their random variable that they're checking. And then maybe this is their positive control. And maybe what they're actually looking for is a recombination event where those two sequences came together. Maybe that's what they're actually measuring here. So a scenario where you would use a positive control would be uh, a different sequence on a chromosome somewhere. Maybe, maybe on a different chromosome. Or maybe you want to use, here's another good example of a good positive control. Often, so let's say you have a mosquito cell. Mosquitoes have three chromosomes. Um, they're diploid. Let's say you know that, that you, your hypothesis is that your gene X that you want to check to see where it is, is you think it's on chromosome three. So you find a different gene that you know for a fact is on chromosome three and you use that as your positive control. And then if you see your fish light up on the same chromosome where your positive control lights up, then you know chromosome three, that's where it's at. Does that make sense? So that would be a scenario where you use a positive control in fish. Um, dang, I barely, I'm going real slow here. Um, okay, sequencing. Sequencing. You will see this a lot, okay? Um, you will see this in the context of Basically, you want to know there's two different types of sequencing. One, two. There's uh, what you would call, I don't know, if you call it classical, you'd call it old, old-fashioned sequencing. Old-fashioned. And then there's uh, high throughput or, quote-unquote, next generation sequencing. Okay, so let's talk about these. Sanger sequencing. How does that work? Um... You want to know basically the process of how these things work and what you're going to be using it for. So Sanger sequencing, you're going to use to visualize the sequence, so the base pairs, A, T, G, C, etc., of a construct that you made, construct that you made, or a PCR product. The key thing where Sanger sequencing is different, and we still use it every day, just because it's old doesn't mean you don't use it. You use this every day. Um, and it's really good. But the key is you use Sanger sequencing when there's one template that you want to sequence. So let's say you made one plasmid, okay? And you need to know what the sequence on that one plasmid is. You, you have one template. That's when you use Sanger sequencing. And the way that it works, ah, let's see if I can do this. <laughs> this is challenging for me as well. Uh, okay, so here's how it works. When you do Sanger sequencing, you mix a pot, of probed DNTPs with normal DNTPs, 
Okay, so let's say you got the wild type DNTPs. Wild type is probably not the correct word, but I'm saying normal DNTPs, A's, T's, G's, C's. And you got freaky DNTPs, A, T, G, C's that are probed with different colors. So let's say your A's are blue, your T's are red, your G's are yellow, and your C's are green. Okay. Now what you do is you do, um, what do you call it a PCR? It's not a PCR. It's like, a, well, it's like a, it's like the first step of PCR. So you have your template. So what goes into the reaction is your template. Okay. That's the thing, the specific thing that you wanted to sequence. So let's say you wanted a plasmid, you inserted gene X, and you want to sequence to see if gene X is in that plasmid. You would put one primer that binds to your plasma, and it's the sequencing reaction is gonna go this way. So it's gonna do a PCR reaction that goes this way, okay? Now the key here is the probed DNTPs stop the reaction. They kill the reaction, it can't PCR anymore, okay? So what's gonna happen is you're gonna produce a series of molecules from this point right here, okay? And your series of molecules are gonna get longer and longer or shorter and shorter based on when the last probe got incorporated. Does that make sense? Okay, so the key here is there's more wild type DNTPs, okay? So the, so the adding in one of these probed ones that stops the reaction is low probability. Ability. Okay, but if it happens, it will stop the PCR. So you produce a series of differentially sized PCR products, and at the end of these, each has a fluorescent probe, which is gonna tell it whether at the end of that molecule is either an A, a T, or a G, or a C. Then you take these different lengths, you run them through a column, which is gonna be size, exclusion. So the fat, the tiny ones, the way that this actually works is, you don't have to know this, but this is, this is actually the opposite. The tiny ones get stuck in the holes, so they don't come off. So the big ones go around the beads and they come off first. So the biggest molecules are gonna come off first, okay? And each of these, they're gonna come off in this order, okay? And your small stuff is gonna come off at the end. Okay, and by looking at these, as they come off the column, there's a laser, laser, that shines a light, and it knows that the first biggest things coming off end with an A. Then the next things coming off end with the T. Then the next things coming off end with the G, because they're shining with different colors, and the laser can read this. And then it goes and it keeps measuring, and you get a sequence. I'm just making this up. You get a sequence, and then the computer program can align the sequence, A, T, G, C, etc. Okay, so that's how you actually get sequences. That's how that's Sanger sequencing. Okay, and the other key thing here, when this data, when you look at this data, um, so let's say you get a file back. What they'll send you is they'll send you two files. One, two. Okay. First file you'll get back is a word file, which is literally sequence. A's, T's, G's, C's. Second thing you'll get back is called a chromatogram. Chromatogram. Okay. This is actually the data. Okay. So you can't look at the sequence and know what's good sequence. You just get A's, T's, and G's, and C's. And the key to realize is that in Sanger sequencing, you want to know this. Your good sequence is going to be here. Okay? In the beginning, in the beginning of all Sanger sequencing reactions, the beginning, I shouldn't have made that green. In the beginning of all Sanger sequences is bad data. At the end of all Sanger sequencing reactions is bad data. That means the sequence that the computer is telling you is crap. But in the middle is good data. Okay? And you know what's good 
by looking at the chromatogram or comparing the sequence. We can compare the sequence to a positive control. If we know, for instance, when we design the primers for this particular gene, we know the sequence of that gene. So we could compare the data to that sequence and we could see if the sequence is matched, okay? So that's what you'll get, the word file. Let's look at a chromatogram. Let's see. Chromatogram. Oh my God, okay, let's, oh, sequencing, there we go, that's what we want. This is what it will look like. This is a chromatogram, okay? And each of these colors corresponds to an A, a C, a C, an A, a C, an A, a G, okay? And the height is the quality of the data. And if it's clean and a sharp peak that doesn't overlap, then it's clean data. Let me show you what bad data looks like. Here's bad data. This is the beginning. Do you know if this spot right here is a G or a T? No, you have no idea because they overlap. That means when the laser was hitting it, it was shining both red and green at the same time. So how does the computer know what the actual sequence is? You don't. And you'll often get this in situations where you have mutations or if you have a population where there's actually two different sequences you'll see an overlap, okay? So later, later, later on in CRISPR, if you want to validate a mutation, oftentimes you'll get heterozygous uh, or chimeric organisms, and they will have data that looks like this that shows you not all the cells in that particular gene have that mutation, okay? So that's what bad data looks like. And if you, once you get to the point where you are, oh, why'd I do that? Once you get to the point where you are making your own data, you'll start to get a sense of where the good data starts, where the bad data starts, and you can all match that to the chromatogram, okay? And hopefully we'll be able to go through, do this, do all this in the lab so you get more experience with it. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. Illumina. I'm just giving you, there's other versions of high throughput. Okay, so high throughput, next generation. One of these is called Illumina. There's different brands, different names. But the key concept here is that it's not like Sanger. Sanger, you're only sequencing one tem template. High throughput is for sequencing millions of templates, different templates at the same time. So that means this is for like sequencing genomes. Sanger you use for like sequencing a gene that you cloned or a PCR product that you're amplifying. Illumina or high throughput you use to sequence genomes, okay? So let me tell you how it works. It's very, very, very similar concept, okay? You got A's, T's, G's, C's that have probes with different colors and you have a glass slide on the glass slide are bound little molecules that will grab DNA, okay? So look like this on and on and on to the end, okay? So on the slide are millions of sites where there is a probe that's bound to the slide that will grab DNA, okay? So then you, your job is to purify genomic DNA from organism. Let's say, what's your favorite organism? Mosquito. Let's say you want to sequence mosquito genome. You purify DNA, genomic DNA from mosquito, and then you just splat it on the slide, okay? What's gonna happen then is those genomic molecules are gonna bind to those sites, like little hairs, okay? Then the Illumina takes that slide and it starts step one, PCR reaction, very similar to the Singer. It basically does Singer reactions a million times a second. So it does a Singer reaction, okay? So you do the PCR reaction. And each of these times, this time, every DNTP is probed. 
So it's going to do literally a PCR reaction that adds one DNTP one time. So you do step one, do a PCR reaction, you add one DNTP. That means that each of these molecules on the end is going to be either an A, a T, a G, or a C. Okay? And then step two, it scans a laser. Let's get a red, red laser. Boom, it scans a laser that goes over, okay? And that laser is able to tell at each of these geometric sites, was it an A, a T, a G, or a C, okay? So you get, the computer will then compile a sequence at each of these geographical bound points. And then it will, step three, wash away the probe. These ones are reversible. Now it can remove that probe and then it will loop and repeat the next base pair. So it literally adds a base pair, scans, adds a base pair, scans, adds a base pair, scans, adds a base pair, scans. And after millions of scans, you sequence millions of DNA molecules with millions of base pair length. Does that make sense? So it can sequence genomes very, very, very quickly. Is that confusing or is that clear? Questions? Here's the, here's the strategy. If something is kind of confusing, literally just go home and go to Wikipedia and Wikipedia and it'll all click. Or watch a YouTube video on it. Just say Illumina sequencing and it will, it'll become clear. Okay? But you got the basic idea. Okay. Let's see. So Sanger visualizes sequence of one template. High throughput visualizes sequence of millions of genomes. Okay. All right. We're done with nucleic acids, proteins. We only have 10 minutes left for proteins. And proteins are like what I like. Uh, okay. So SDS page. I know this is review. It should be. Has anybody not heard of SDS page? You have it? Okay, so it's not, okay, shit, I should, have, I should have started with proteins then. Okay, that's okay. That's good, because this is fun. Um, okay, so SDS page, um, page, let's just write it out. Page is polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Okay, I know you know gel electrophoresis, because we just did that, right, with nucleic acids. So what would you think that SDS page would be? What would be the goal? The yeah, you separate proteins based on size. Anytime you see a gel, your mind should think, I'm separating things, usually by size. Polyacrylamide is the polymer. It's not agarose this time, it's polyacrylamide. So you're using a different chemical to separate out, but the concept is the same. You're making micropores. Big proteins are gonna have a hard time running through the pores. Little proteins are gonna go through very, very fast, okay? So SDS page, is size um, differentiation of proteins. So it's like the agarose gel of proteins. Okay, so what's SDS? SDS is sodium dodecyl sulfate. Do you guys know what that is? Detergent. Yes, excellent. Detergent, what do detergents do? Clean. Yes, they do. Um, but also in molecular biology, we use detergents to denature proteins. That means we don't want to study, if you want to separate out proteins based on their size, one of the confounding factors could be the quaternary structure or the tertiary structure, which we talked about. We want to basically figure out a way to make proteins like strings, like strings of DNA that are just the beads on a string amino acids. Okay, SDS is the way that we do that. The other reason we need it is if you compare this to the agarose gel, let's say this is DNA. What's the charge of DNA gonna naturally be? Negative. Negative, because of the phosphate backbone. So you run an electric current with anything with DNA and it will run away. What's the charge of a protein? It's gonna depend, it's gonna depend on the amino acid. So we need a hack 
that's going to coat all proteins consistently with negative charge. Okay? And SDS is what does that. So SDS binds to the linear string of your protein. It denatures it, it pulls it apart into a string and coats it. Each of the SDS molecules is negative. So basically SDS is mimicking your negative phosphate backbone. It's a chemical that you're adding that creates consistent negative charge. Now let's compare proteins. Let's big protein, medium protein, little protein. The big protein is going to be the most negative because it's going to have bound more SDS molecules. This one's going to be medium. This one's going to be least negative. So now you're really going to separate out proteins based on two factors, the speed at which they run away from the current and the size. Okay. So when you run an SDS page gel, it's, it's going to look the same. It's going to be bands on a gel. Okay. But it's going to be now corresponding to proteins separated based on size. And your big stuff is going to be at the top and your little stuff is going to be down here. And it's the same thing. You're going to change the percent of polyacrylamide based on the size of what you're looking at. Okay. So if you're looking at something, a tiny, tiny protein is 10 kilodaltons. A big protein is 200 kilodaltons. If you want to look at something tiny, you make high percent polyacrylamide gels. If you want to look at things that are big, you make very, very low percent. This is like, so high percentage would be, oh, it's been a while. Um, you're catching me. Low percentage I know would be like 6%. To 8%. High percentage is, I think, like 15%. So your range is going to be around there. And when you mix up the gel, that's literally what's going to be your varying, depending on what you want to look at. So where does the SDS bind to the amino acids? Like the R groups? Or? That's a good question that I don't know the answer to. So let's Google it. Uh, Google. Let's see here. SDS binding amino acids. Um, I don't know. You find the answer and then you come tell me, report back to me. <laughs> it's good when you catch me because you guys get to see the limits of my knowledge as well. Um, but I should know that. That's a good question. Let me get back to you on that. Uh, how much time do we have? Two minutes. Shit. Uh, I'm trying to think of what is worth. We can just continue this in lab maybe. Because this is important. We should have enough time in lab. So I'm going to not rush myself, if that's OK. This stuff is really important. Because if you don't know how to, if you're not comfortable looking at the data, then um, you got a, you got a problem. So let's look at what, let me see here. Let me pull up a SDS page from a uh, assignment that I gave you guys. Let's see here, courses. I have too many folders, courses. Um, biotechnology, what is it in? I think it's in module one. I think it's the last one, bacterial operons, PBAD. They have an SDS page in here. You see this? That is an SDS page reaction, okay? So what you're seeing here is, this is whole lysate from a cell on the lane one and you're seeing a bunch of different proteins, and you added Kumasi, which is a stain that stains your proteins blue. So you're seeing a bunch of different proteins based on size. This is soluble protein extract, so when you kill cells, stuff will, certain proteins are insoluble and they'll precipitate, other proteins will stay in solution. So this is the soluble protein extract, and this is a protein that they're actually purifying. 
So they, they have been able to express a whole bunch of this singular protein, which runs right at this size. And in lanes three, four, five, six, they've done differential steps to purify it. So you, what you're seeing is the background pro proteins disappearing as it gets more and more and more pure. Does that make sense? So this is important. And you'll see stuff like this. But what you want to know is if you see bands like this and it's protein, it's at usually SDS page. Okay, so let's stop there and then we go to the other place for the lab.